start? Yeah, let's go. So let's start. One, two, three, four, yes. All right, so, hello everyone. Either here in this very room or remotely watching the stream. Actually, quite a lot of people, much more, many more than we anticipated. Uh, so, uh, this lecture, or not this lecture, this lecture is about to start, but this, uh, this course is coming to an end, and there are still several topics we have yet to cover. And for this very purpose, we have a special guest here tonight, Namat Mekmekci, a game designer from uh, Hollow Lantern Studio, who is going to talk about uh, game design. Uh, if you recall correctly, during our very first lecture, we covered some very important topics, such as what a game is, what are the main aspects of games, such as um, gameplay, rules, and game mechanics. So that this is a very crucial topic to comprehend, and Mehmet will do a quick recap over those topics, and then he's going to extend it by the very introduction into game design. And he's going to take the first half of the lecture, and I'm going to follow with the other half, and then I will talk about uh, indie game development, or indie games, indie game crisis, so to speak. All right, so without further ado, I guess we can start. Sure. Let's go. And let's start with game design. All right. I have to keep remembering talking to the microphone. All right, uh, hi everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Mehmet. It's okay if you can't pronounce it, nobody can. Uh, so I'll quickly talk a little bit about myself before we start. All right, today's topic is, of course, like Adam uh, just explained, it's introduction to game design. What is it to design games? How do we do it? What are the main aspects of it? Um, that's me with the cool picture. Uh, I've been in the game industry for about five, six years now. Uh, originally, I studied automotive engineering here, actually, in Cevote, Facultas Strojny. Uh, and then afterwards, I got a huge interest in games and software, so I started studying it, doing indie projects on it. And then briefly, uh, I actually did it full-time in Bohemia Interactive Simulations. I was a technical game designer there. I was working on... on um, probably most of you know Arma, right? Uh, the Arma games. Uh, so we were building cool simulation modules for, for the uh, Arma engine. And then for the last two years, I, uh, I've been working for a tech company as an engineering manager. So I lead uh, software teams who work on front-end, back-end, depending on the project. Uh, but I still consider myself as a game designer because uh, a big part of the job of the leadership for me is to, of course, design some, some challenges for them. Uh, whether it's designing a career path, how to make the projects more understandable, how to make sure they grow as engineers and developers. Um, so with that, I'll quickly show you guys a teaser trailer that we pre prepared for my last project. So you have, an, I hope, better understanding of, of what I do as a game designer. Let's see, alt tab. All right. Yeah. Interview number 9496, resident 59. Define your day, 59. It was okay. Nothing special. Noted. Do you consider yourself as an important part of the community, 59? How would I define that? Do you often find yourself having difficulties defining yourself? No, Hobbs. I just find some things hard to define. Do you ever find yourself questioning why you are here? I don't believe I have any reason to. Yet, you are aware that everything we do here is for your own good. For the good of everyone. I... yeah, I... I believe that. Do you believe in our cause, 59? Do you still believe in... us? Hesitation has been noted. So to better explain uh, 
What I really do as a part of game design is mostly narrative story. Um, but my projects are usually about, let's say, story heavy video games. I try to focus on world, characters, how can we implement them into the game? How can we teach the player better uh, about the world, the characters, and all of that? This specific project is, uh, it has been on hold for, for a year now due to t the team disbanding, and it's one of the many problems of the indie scene, of course, which Adam will talk about in the second half. Um, but I have some, some newer projects. Uh, and with that, all right, let's, let's start then. I love starting presentations with an inspirational quote, right? It's, it's always a great way to attract people's attention. Uh, in this case, it's one of, from one of my favorite books about game design, from Jesse Schell. And he says, an artist is someone who takes you where you could never go alone. To me, it's very important because uh, quite often we, we perceive game development as just a technical thing. People sit down, they write some code, they just paste some beautiful pictures and graphics to it, and then that's about it, right? Like all the other games that we play and, and we experience, they all come from coding and engine and, and technical side of things. Uh, but in the end, the reality of it is it's much different. Uh, and quite often, uh, I still do find it as a mistake that game developers think that it's just a technical job. Uh, but it is much bigger than that. Uh, all the memorable games, the good games that you have played and you still remember today, they probably had some aspects of them and they took you to places that you probably couldn't have gone yourself. Whether it's the story, the environment, the graphics, the sound design, the music, there are so many aspects of it that you should think about, uh, even when you're starting from scratch, uh, that will help you to connect with the player. All right, so then who is a game designer? So we just, I just talked about a bunch of cool terms. Um, like, what do they exactly do? How do you become one? Why do we even need game designers? So what I just talked about, like if, if the game is just about sitting down and writing code and then hiring an artist to draw some beautiful pictures for you, uh, and maybe a sound designer so he, like he or she can give you the sound assets, why do we need someone to think about this whole experience? I mean, isn't it just enough uh, for us to gather the team, sit our uh, butts down, and then just come up with a game? Why do we need to think about it at all? Um, Probably not just as game designers or game developers, but as software developers, you will get this question a lot. Why should you think about features, right? Why should you think about the development itself? Come up with better ways to do it. Um, I mean, the answer is quite simple, right? I can just give you a definition. I can just tell you, with a, with a note that I wrote here, a game designer is the person who unifies every other part of the game within boundaries with one goal in mind. Offering an experience to the player. A fun experience, a memorable experience that stays with them. An experience in the end that teaches them about themselves or the world around them. It's a semi-quote from, from one of the books that I, I inspire from, from Raf Koster. And I think that's it, right? We reached the goal of this class. I just taught you about game designers. What do they do? That's it, the class should be done. Uh, but here's the thing. If this, was, if this class itself was a game, if this lecture itself was a game, then I miserably failed. I just read you like a short paragraph statement and you probably don't even remember it. So like if the goal was for you to really learn what game design is and what game designers do, I think I have just miserably failed. And it would have been a very short solution, right? For me to just be here, give you a text answer that you can memorize. Um, but if the goal was, again, for you to understand, then I think I have failed. If anyone, has remem if anyone remembers what I just read, kudos to you, you have a great memory. Uh, all right, so then let's take a step back, let's discuss and hopefully reach to an agreement altogether uh, on certain things that actually craft the game and uh, craft the game design itself. What is fun? It's a very deep question, it's super philosophical. Why do we have fun as humans, right? Like, such a deep question. And I, I mean, I put a really cool definition here from Oxford Dictionary. I prepared this presentation last week and I still can't remember what it actually says. 
Uh, but the important keywords to me is when you think about what is fun is, of course, pleasure, enjoyment, or amusement, right? It is something that we do. There's an activity. Uh, and when you think about an activity, don't just think about a physical activity. It can be just you're just sitting with your friends and talking, having a conversation. Uh, you're just listening to someone, or you're just listening to music. All these activities can be fun. Uh, and what's important to, to outline here is that for you to have fun, you have to do it willingly. Uh, if we just stop for a moment and think about that. You may be enjoying taking walks, right? Uh, take, taking a walk may be fun. You may be going to a park, uh, I don't know, walk with a friend, uh, and then just, you may consider it as fun. It's a, it's a free time fun activity. But one of the important questions there is, like, would it really be fun if someone forced you to do it? So like, think about this class, ironically. If someone really forced you to be here today in this room, at this very hour, Maybe there's like 20 other beautiful things that you would rather do. Would you really have fun? It's an open question. Adam, would you have fun if someone really forced you to be here today? Not really. Yeah, I guess. So the important thing to understand is that you can never force someone to have fun. Maybe you can force them into certain situations where they have fun, sure, if they are open-minded. Uh, but when you're developing games, when you're working on games, it's very important to understand that the player has to be there willingly uh, at their own free time. They have to choose to be there, choose to play the game. Okay, let's move on then. Here's a, a definition again from Raf Koster. It's more biological. In the end, fun is an activity and some chemicals are released in our body. So like as engineers, quite often we love these kind of definitions. Uh, when you do something and you like it, endorphins are released and you have fun. It's, it's that simple. Okay. Except when you play a game by EA. That's, that's illegal. So what is play then? We just established, I hope, I hope, uh, and again, if you have any questions from now until the end, feel free to stop me. We just discussed and sort of agreed that fun is when you do something, it's an activity, and, and you like it, you enjoy it. What is play then? What, what is the difference? What is different in play? If I'm having fun with anything that I do, what, what turns it into play? So I can reach to having a game. Johan um, Huizinga, very famous, old book. Again, there's a very good definition here. I'll give you just five seconds so you can read it. So in the end, what I understand from this is that for it to be play, there has to be some rules. So again, super quick thought experiment. After this class, me and Adam will probably walk to the tram, right? The, that whole activity can be fun. But if I tell Adam, Adam, you know what? There's a tram, let's race to it. The first person who reaches it will buy the, uh, the other person will buy him a beer or a coffee. I suddenly introduce some rules into that fun activity and suddenly it turned into play. Now two people are competing with one single objective in mind. So once again to outline what, what, what we've been through so far, Fun is the activity that you do. You do it and you enjoy it. Cool. You introduce some structure and rules into it and it turns into play. So having the activity itself is not enough. I have to introduce some rules to it. Then what is a game? Yes, sir. I mean, is it really the rules or the goal that motivates us to have fun? So uh, like, if you challenge someone, mm -hmm. you make as some like a goal to reach, mm -hmm. like uh, rules by themselves. I don't think they really make you enjoy something. No, that's a good, that's a great point. If we just introduce the goal without rules, and if we said, okay, two people uh, they're racing towards the same goal, if there are no agreements with the rules, would it feel fair? To me, that's the important question. 
if Adam says, cool, I'll take the motorcycle here and I'll just run to the tram. I'll lose. Will I have fun? <laughs> I mean, I know I wouldn't. Maybe some people would be like, cool, he just, he just cheated and that's smart. But as long as we have an agreement on what the rules are and the game itself, the play itself feels fair, uh, I think the goals may become obsolete. We will get to examples, of course. Like, this is a very, very good question. I love it. And during the examples, let's outline it again together. So what about a game then? Like, we established fun, we established play. Jesse Shell says, a game is a problem-solving activity approach with a playful attitude. Now there's the key point, at least to me, once again. When there's a problem, there's a fun activity, there are rules to it, there's a structure, maybe a goal. And when we introduce a problem or a problem-solving activity to it, it turns into a game. Again, all these definitions, they, they may feel very deep, unnecessarily deep, or too much open to interpretation, and that is on purpose. How people perceive what a game is or what fun is, sometimes it purely depends on the person, depends on the player. Uh, but to me, on the, on the very basic level, uh, just like you said, there are rules, there's a fun activity, once I start introducing a goal into it, and some, some sort of a problem-solving activity, because in the end, if you don't define what the goal is and how to reach it, how will you reach it? So the discussion becomes around, there's a problem that is defined, maybe the goal, maybe reaching the goal itself. I try to reach to it, and that itself turns it into a game. Ralph Koster's theory about this is that we as humans, we're programmed to learn. His book is called Theory of Fun. So he's trying to define a new theory on how we as humans are having fun. And his basic approach and, and defense is that we are programmed to survive. And one of the best ways for us to survive is to learn. We, we, we learn new things, we see new places, we attend class for a better job in the future, we challenge ourselves at work. You can include so many things into this. In the end, he says, we enjoy these things because it makes us learn things. And we like learning things it, because it increases our survivability in this planet. It's one of those very interesting approaches to, to video games, in my opinion. That we enjoy playing them, because in the end they're teaching us something about the real world or about ourselves. And quite often as players, we hope to use these in the real world, because it makes us better, right? If you're a good FPS player, uh, I've been thinking about this for a very long time, six years now I've been in the industry. If you're a very good FPS player, does that really help you in, in real life, right? Maybe not, uh, you know, w when you're using weapons and such, but it helps with the hand-eye coordination. It helps with the social structure. If I'm really good at, like, I don't know, Battle Royale games, helps me with the social structure. I have more credit among, among other players, among friends. Helps me with eye, hand-eye coordination. Helps me with, like, strategizing, maybe in real life, how to approach different problems. So Ralph Koster in the end says that we love playing games because they teach us things. Okay. So we have somewhat of a shaky agreement, right? We discussed fun, play, game. So how do we construct a game then? Like using this information or these agreements, how do we construct Super Mario, Zelda, uh, Metroid, Pokemon, Raid, Horizon, so many different types of games, so many video games. How do I construct them? So, if we use what we've discussed so far, if fun is the activity, and it doesn't re need rules to be fun, an activity doesn't really need, need rules to be fun, right? That's what we discussed in, in the first few slides. Then it means for a video game, uh, to even exist, there has to be some sort of mechanics, some sort of player input. Me, as a player, in that video game, I should be doing some activity where, where I'm in control. Otherwise, it turns into a movie, right? It turns into a very long cutscene. Uh, and of course, there are people who, who love that. There are people who love walking simulators, for example. 
uh, where the player input is minimal. But it's very important to outline here is that there is still player input. There's some sort of an interaction between the player and the game. And very simply, just to come up with a definition, we call these game mechanics. So the player can move, the player can climb, they can run, they can shoot, they can hide, hide behind covers. Think about it, some of the games that you like playing, how you interact with the game. One important thing here is, again, for me it's very important to understand. Screw the rules for a moment inside a video game. Will you keep playing the game if the mechanics weren't fun? If the activity that generated fun didn't exist or it wasn't good at all? In some games the story may be incredible, but if the mechanics are horrible, we will stop playing. Because the activity itself, without all the rules, doesn't feel fun. Doesn't feel like you're really in control. You try to jump, the character dies. Okay. And then we establish play, right? We discussed fun, its activity, and then we establish play. And we said for, for play, there has to be rules, there has to be some structure introduced to that fun activity. In a video game, we define these as, as rules. The rules of the game, the game world, or the rules for that specific player character type. If the health of the player reaches below zero, below or equals to zero, the player dies. That's a rule. There's no player input there. As a player, you may just stand where you are and receive all the enemy shots, right? But if you receive enough of them, you will die. And that's a rule. That is an agreement between me, the person who developed the game, and the player. Or like if the player can run faster than a certain amount. Can or cannot. If the player falls from 30 meters, they will die. These are rules. The player can have some input to control the mechanics, but in the end they do not control if they die or not if they fall from 30 meters. And it's very important for us to understand that the rules that bound the player, they're actually an agreement between you, the game developer, and the player. And for that, it has to be fair. The player has to understand, and of course they expect that the rules are fair. Think about some of the hard games that you played. That like, there are some enemies and you're just slaying them, right? It's, it's fun. You're destroying first enemy, second enemy, and then one enemy shows up out of nowhere and one-shots you. You, you. you died out of nowhere. It is frustrating. Because that wasn't the rule. I, I've, I've just spent half an hour killing all the other enemies. My skills were enough. What happened? Well, where did this enemy come from? So since the rule now feels unfair, you feel like you didn't learn anything. And of course, one of, one of the jobs, one of the many parts of this job is to teach the player that these rules and how they should stay consistent. And of course, at the very end, I have to give some sort of a feedback to the player so they understand. If the player falls and they dies, I have to tell them that they died or I have to show them somehow. And of course, when we put these two together, the fun activity and the play, uh, so the activities and the rules together, I get the core gameplay. So I'm putting them together to craft gameplay, core gameplay all together. Now, here's, in my opinion, where a lot of indie developers fail. You have, a, you have a core, beautiful core mechanics. You have, you have rules and you crafted the gameplay. And quite often the game stops right there or it doesn't expand. One of the many things that we do as game designers is to lay out some patterns for the player. So imagine, once again, imagine a game that you like playing. The game teaches you the core mechanics. There's some player input. Then the game teaches you the rules. It says, hey, if you do this, you're gonna die. Or if you do this, you're gonna win. And then it lays out some patterns for you. These patterns are, are there for you to realize yourself and practice your skills with the game, right? You want to use those mechanics, you want to use your understanding of these rules all together to actually just practice and keep learning. 
a good example I can think of is even with, with, with uh, we will go back to examples altogether, but even if you think about the simplest games, right, like Pac-Man, the, the pure game mechanic there is that you just move the Pac-Man. The rule is that if you get caught by the ghosts and you die. And the pattern is just laid out for you. There's a giant screen, a map for you, where you just move around and collect things, and you're like, okay, I'm getting the hang of it. But there's an important final part for the learning, the growth to happen, right? So I, I play the game, there's an input, I understand the rules, I've been practicing my skills in the game, I'm shooting the easier enemies. And then there has to be some sort of a challenge for the player. We want them to test their skills, what they've been learning through those patterns this past hour. We want them to test themselves and hopefully succeed so they can feel that validation that they have grown. What's the most common way to, ch to challenge player in video games? It's not a trick question. <laughs> I'm very interested in the answers. We discussed it with Adam. Can you guys think of any examples? What's a challenge in a video game? Can I get a boss? Exactly. It's the most common answer and I, I love it. It's true, because it's true. Bowser in Super Mario is a boss. You've been practicing your skills for a few levels. You've been seeing those patterns. You're like, oh, I see a platform. I will jump on it. That's what I've been doing, right? I'm learning. I'm teaching myself through the game. And at the end, the game is like, yeah, cool. Let's see if you really mastered your skills. Here's Bowser. Or like if you think about Dark Souls, many other games, bosses are there for you to challenge yourself. But of course, one loop is not enough, right? I use the gameplay, I use the patterns, I see the challenge, I conquer it, but now I have to go back. Now the gameplay changes. It's either the mechanic that's changing or the rules. The mechanic changes by, let's say, we introduce something new to the player. We gave them a new power. We gave them a new equipment. Now we're telling them, hey, you're, here's a new equipment. You're stronger now. So I'm going to throw different challenges at you. It can be a different jumping mechanic. It can be a different movement mechanic. And then I add all of them together, a new challenge. I keep expanding the loop until the end of the game, right? So the player doesn't get bored playing it. Does it all make sense so far, guys? Yeah? Great. Ooh. And then a few examples. I, how many should do we have time for one or two? See? One or two? Okay. So huh. Oh the videos aren't there, you're right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Got a lot of awards. Pinnacle of game design. Do I pause with space? Yes, I do. Okay. Who's played it, by the way? Have you guys played it? No? Okay. All right, what's the, what's the player input here? What's the game mechanic? Running. Running. Movement, yeah. What else? Camera control is another one, right? Player can control the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go a little forward. Cool. What's the player input here? There's an equipment, there's something on the ground. The player picks up whatever's on the ground, right? It's also player input. I'm giving the player the control. They may choose to pick it up or not, it's up to them. What are some of the rules here in these type of games? Legend of Zelda, think of an open world game that you played. Once again, please. Limited number of items. Exactly, that's a rule. Limited number of items in your inventory, that's a rule. 
I'm forcing the player to think what, what they will pick up. What else? Like, if Link loses all, all his hearts, he will die, right? <coughs> That's the rule. What about if, if Link falls from 20 meters or 30 meters? What will happen to him? He will take fall damage, potentially die. But here's the thing, think about the, the picture that I just showed. Gameplay mechanic, rules, player finished the first cycle, they conquered a challenge and I went back. Now in Legend, The Legend of Zelda, they're not changing the mechanics, they're changing the rules. The game gives you an equipment, which is a glider, right? And then it tells you, hey, you can actually defy gravity now if you're, if you're good with it. So suddenly the game world changed. It introduced a very slight new mechanic to me, and it sort of twisted the rules. It's one of the many games that you can expand on your game. Or even if you're making a new game, you can just think about a game that exists and just twist the rules. Does it make sense? Yeah? Cool. All right. X. Let's quickly go through another one. Mm. Yeah, Uncharted. Let's do Uncharted. Okay, here's a cutscene, and then the gameplay will begin. It's definitely Sam's tower. Come on. This way. Pardon me. Excuse me? Excuse me. How long do you think before Rafe gets here? What's the player input here? What's the mechanic so far? Time to find out. The movement again, right? I'm, I'm moving him as a player. It's more realistic, of course, compared to many other games. Gunfight begins. What's the input here, then? Shooting. It suddenly turned into a shooting game. I was, as a player, I was just able to move the character. Now I can shoot with him. And it, it's bound to a different, different set of mechanics, different set of player input. OK. I'm shooting the enemies, they're shooting me, I can take cover, cool, cool, great. What are some of the rules that you can think of here that I should introduce to the player? Or that may already exist in the game world? Exactly, one of the many rules. If something explodes, explodes right next to you, you'll probably die or take damage. Uh, if you're not in cover and the bullet hits you, you lose health. Uh, if there are certain things you can jump over and you can't. These are all rules. The mechanics are still there, but the rules are defining how I perceive the game. And we can go back to the goals, for example. What would be a goal in a, in a game like this? In Uncharted, can you guys think of the goal, if you've played it or not, seeing a gameplay like this? It's like a movie, right? You know, you start somewhere, there's action. What will be a goal for this kind of game? Progress through story. Exactly. Progress through story. That's the goal. You're at point A, and through the gameplay and the rules, you're trying to get to B. That's your goal as a player. Great. We'll go back to these gameplays and different analysis during, during the lab. So I'll just go back to the presentation now. Ah, there it is. OK. So we established fun, we established play, we established game, we discussed game mechanics, rules. So in the end, a game designer should be, in my opinion, someone who designs and builds the mechanics the player can use, right? What is the player input? It's one of my jobs to think about that. How will the player interact with the world and the game? What sort of mechanics they will use? Does it make sense? I love using, using an example. Um, think, think about a game where I'm like interacting with this class. Picking up this mouse would, could be a mechanic, because I need to use it for this lecture. But triple jump, 
as a game designer, I have to think twice. Why would I triple jump in a class? It would be cool, sure. I think you guys would have fun if I just pulled a triple jump here. Uh, but I have to think that if, if in that game world, in the context of the game, do these mechanics and rules make sense? So I design the mechanics as a game designer. So um, I design and create the rules, of course, in discussion with other people. Do these rules make sense? Are they consistent throughout the game? Or if I'm changing them, am I communicating them to the player? I'm creating patterns, right, for the player so they can practice, learn new things. I build challenges for them. Can be a boss fight, can be a beautiful cutscene or like a huge arena where you can fight enemies. And in the end, I give fee feedback to the player. Did they succeed? They can progress. Did they fail? I have to give feedback to them so they can keep practicing and increasing their skills. And in the end, again, there are some conflicting thoughts on this, but to me, a game designer and any game developer should be a teacher, someone who can connect with the player and teach them things. You're trying to teach them the mechanics, the rules, they're like your students. You want them to succeed, of course, otherwise they will stop playing the game. And Raf Koster defines this, a good game, of course, one that teaches everything it has to offer before the player stops playing. I can spend five years on a game and create 20 hours of gameplay. If you're all bored within the first 30 minutes, as a game designer, I have failed miserably. And all that development cost can be flushed down to the toilet. It is very important for us as game developers, and hopefully for you guys too, uh, to think about how can I make the player play this game more? What can it make more interesting? A couple of minutes of beautiful gameplay is really impressive. It's good. But it's also good to make it consistent, right? So the player keeps playing. So I have to come up with new ways to expand the gameplay, the yeah. game, the story. And if we take game design as something like engineering, right? We have engineering and then we have software engineers, I don't know, mechanical engineers, electronics engineers. Mm -hmm. Then if you take the game design, you get a lot of subdivisions. So if game designers are teachers, what should a gameplay designer teach? Mr. Adam. What should, a game, <laughs> what should a gameplay designer teach? The gameplay. Hmm? the gameplay, the mechanics. What should an AI behavior designer teach to the player? How the enemy behaves, right? If you're in a gunfight or whatever. Narrative designer teaches you about the story, the world, the characters. Combat designer teaches you how to fight the enemies, and so on. There are many subdivisions today in, in game design. And of course, that's because the, the industry is growing, the teams are growing, so we need more people specializing in certain things and how to do them better. Another important part is, of course, to think about when... Yes, sir? What's the difference between the combat and... and Encounter. So, me, it seems really similar. Uh, they are. They are. In the industry, in many studios, they are. Combat designer focuses on, of course, the combat. It's in the name. But the encounter designer works with the level designer to design, let's say, more specific encounters. A combat designer, for example, may focus on how the player's fighting with the sword, those mechanics, some sort of interaction with the enemy. But an encounter designer will, will focus on the boss fight, a specific encounter. And of course, when you think about that, the pacing comes into action. You can't throw three bosses at the player as soon as the game starts, right? You have to place enough patterns so they feel ready for the fight. So an encounter designer will work together with a level designer to place those out. And then the goal is to give you a memorable encounter, not just any enemy fight. 
All right? Another important question, or group of questions. Uh, who am I designing this game for? Is there a single game right now that is created that applies to everyone, that will be interesting to everyone on the planet? I mean, I hope not. That would be like an incredible design and I would feel really bad about myself. Um, but no, I mean, the short answer is no. No such game exists. So you have to think about who, who are you building this for as a game. What's the hook? What's one thing in the game that will interest them? Because we said the fun should come willingly, right? I can't force someone to have fun. So I have to do something, think about the person and interest them so they will even start playing the game. And when we quite often do that with player personas. So we try to come up with people that may not really exist, but they may, I don't know. And I try to come up with, okay, what would this person think? I try to anticipate. What would they do in this situation? How will they approach this situation? Will they be able to conquer the boss fight or is it too hard for them? Or is it too easy for them? And quite often, uh, to me, this is very important for narrative ga games as well. Uh, we try to come up with empathy maps. Would this person enjoy this? Would they be shocked? If I killed the main character right now, would, the player, would this kind of player be like, whoa, what just happened? What a twist? Or would they be like, that was stupid. Why would you kill the main character? I don't want to lose the attention of the player. I want them to keep playing, right? Uh, so quite often we will create a bunch of these, five of them, ten of them, depends on how much time and budget you have, of course. And when you design things, when you develop the game, you want to design something that applies to these people. And of course, in practice, one of the many things we do, I do as well, personally, is, is to uh, analyze patterns in other games. Like if I'm making a narrative game or a first-person shooter, I will definitely go and look at good first-person shooters. What did I enjoy in, in them as a person, as a player? Was it the combat? Was it the story? Was it the environment? I will try to learn something out of them so I can expand on it. I will always think about like, Halo was cool. It just came out like last week. Really cool, I love it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. What's, what, what do I not like about it? How could they have made it better in my opinion? Because that can be a great spark for you to start your next, next video game project, if you wanna do start one. Um, these are the sources, so if you want examples on uh, player personas, empathy maps, patterns in different video games, there are great sources online. You can use them to, to analyze and come up with ideas. And then one of the many things uh, we do as game designers, of course, the famous game design document. We think about all of this stuff that I just, I just discussed with you guys, and then we, before we even begin development quite often, we try to write them down. So even on paper, we try to see, does it make sense? If it's very stupid, even on paper, if it's not understandable, like if I can't understand something just reading a paragraph about it, then how will I try to offer a 20-hour experience to the player? So I try to catch things, we try to catch things right at the idea phase. We show it to people, <coughs> we try to get feedback on it, and then we prototype, test it with other people, we do play tests, right? I want to see if the people who are playing it, they're enjoying it, if they understand everything about it. Again, there are some very good examples online on game design documents. Uh, you can take a look at them and take inspiration. Uh, and with that, I will end this part and give the word to Adam. Uh, if you want to make games, go into the video game industry. It's both happy and sad. It's sad to me because there's still so many people in the game industry who don't understand this statement. To them, it's pure development, software development. And I, after all these years, I still beg to differ. To me, there's a deeper side to it. Um, if you do decide to go into the video game industry, make your own games, work at a studio, 
please never, never forget that your ultimate goal as game developers is to offer a fun experience, an entertaining experience. It would be amazing to have more particle effects, beautiful graphics, sure. But in the end, if the player is not having fun with it, you're failing at somewhere. And it's definitely OK to fail as a game developer, as long as you, you learn from it. Uh, and with that, here are some sources. If you're interested, again, to, to follow this as a profession, full-time, part-time, uh, try to look into these books. All the links, everything is in the presentation. And yeah, with that, I am done with the first part. I'll give the microphone to Adam. So thank you, Mehmet, for a very descriptive introduction to game design. And now we are going to actually venture into more, let's say, darker parts of game industry, which is called indie apocalypse. But first, we will need to actually identify what indie games are. The fact is that it's not set in stone. There are many definitions around, and we are going to cover three of them. So the first one. First one uh, indie game is an independent game that is identified by the freedom and courage to put the idea above the profit. And I would like to emphasize on, this, on those two words, freedom and courage. Because the thing is that uh, indie games or indie game developers are very flexible in sharp contrast with AAA game developers. Because as, as um, Jim Ryan, who is the CEO of the PlayStation division, he once stated that uh, it's very risky for a big company to come up with a new concept or a new brand. And game developers or indie game developers have many more benefits in this matter. Because they have nothing to lose, basically. They can prototype anything they like. They can come up with, let's say, uh, unconventional concepts or some uh, alternative gameplay, exotic gameplay, like Undertale, for instance. Next one. Indie games are developed by individuals, small teams, or small independent companies having little to no budget available. This depends, but mostly it's a really it's like private investment. There are some crowdfunding, crowdfunding initiatives, but it's rare. There are also some, uh, let's say, well-known game developers who happen to, to found their own startups while being backed back up by some other companies. Jade Raymond, for instance. Jade Raymond. She worked for Ubisoft, uh, she oversaw the Assassin's Creed series, and then she started her own studio. However, the studio is owned by Google, backed up, and, but she takes a full control. But still, usually it's about the budget, and the budget is very little. Next one. Indie games are games that are smaller in size, less taxing on hardware, and focusing mostly on art design. So art design it is. It's always about trade-offs and sacrifices to be made. Because if you don't have the people, you can't just outperform the big companies. You need to focus, you need to dedicate your time on something very specific. And art design is one of them, one of those topics. <clears throat> art design, experimental gameplay, and everything of this sort. Um, the topic, or the term indie games, it's quite new. It has been a long until 2004 or 5, when several developers uh, began promoting themselves as indie, indie developers. Before that, they considered themselves as, we can say, isolated hobbyists. And uh, the problem is that the game industry grew bigger and bigger in the late 1990s with the introduction of 3D accelerators. And uh, it was quite difficult for smart teams to come up with new games because nobody wanted to play two-dimensional games, and most indie games are actually 2D. Therefore, uh, the indie game development, or independent game development, was thrown back then into freeware, free, freeware scene. And then 2005 came in, also with some other distribution capabilities, such as Steam was launched in 2003. And Case Story came in, and it brought many, many people to awareness that there are still small teams that are working on their games, and they can still deliver something that offers a gameplay of as high quality as some mainstream games in terms of gameplay. Then Bread came in by Jonathan Blow. Many people wanted more and more games like Bread. Of course, Limbo, uh, Minecraft. Limbo is a side-scroller that introduced this uh, 
what is it called? Trial and death gameplay, where the player is actually forced to fail until he or she finds the right solution. Fez, there is quite a nice story about Fez. Uh, there's a whole movie about Fez and other games like Meat, Super Meat Boy and also something about bread. It's called The Indie Game. Indie Games, the movie, was released in 2012. You can watch it. Undertale, I mentioned last week, Old Boy from Deep Ed Studios, set in Norway. It took eight years to develop this game and they wanted to show pixel art in its, like the beauty of pixel art in its entirety, in its full extent. Figment, another game similar to Raymond and Botanicula in terms of gameplay and perhaps even a bit of graphics. It takes place in the human mind and every single emotion like anxiety or fear has got their own character incorporated, incorporated in the game. And in most focusing on realistic sound effects and many, many others. Uh, if you compare AAA games and indie games, you can say that AAA games used Players or gamers tend to consume AAA games like food. And uh, of course, the companies offer cutting edge graphics because they can afford it, large studios and massive campaigns, and surprisingly, sometimes it's not even enough. I prepared this, this slide a year ago, just before the game I don't want to mention went public. Uh, there's a nice quote from David, David Ogilvy, who is he was the father of advertisements, and he once said that great marketing only makes bad product fail faster. And there is also like overpromise, under delivery, and uh, this connection detachment. But still, they offer cutting edge graphics. And indie games, they should go for modest graphics. There are some exceptions, though. Ninja Theory can be a good example. Hellblade, Senua Sacrifice. And there is one thing interesting about this game, because even though the budget was quite large, it was still considered an indie game, and Hellblade had to sacrifice something at, for the benefit of realism and for the benefit of, of cutting-edge graphics. If you play the game, you will realize that uh, it looks like an interactive movie. Most of the parts are really well scripted, but the physical interaction is very limited. So, of course, indie game developers usually choose modest graphics. Most of them are actually two-dimensional because it's very difficult to make 3D games. If you decide to have humanoid objects, you will need to make voiceovers, most probably. You will need animations, you will need skeletal animations, skinning, and lots, lots and lots of work just for, just for making it work and talk. Small office, actually, that's a great thing to have, at least to have an office for, for any team. Some teams are still, are still working from their parents' garage. And of course, marketing, going to conferences, promoting their products on Facebook pages, joining Discord, joining some communities, and so on and so on. All right, so that's the difference. There are also some benefits, actually, to be an indie game developer, and one of them is cross-functionality. Because as an indie game developer, you need to span multiple areas. If you remember the last diagram from the last minute talk, there are many and many professions in the industry. And the fewer people you have in your team, the more, more cross-functional you need to become. And also, and this is also very important, you have the power to incorporate your own ideas to the game. And this is very motivating when people have the power to affect the things on the product they are working on. Sadly, that's not the case for AAA game developers. The thing is that the market is very competitive. It means that if the studio would like to hire five people, they would like to hire the best of the best of the best, focusing or experts of their own domain. So they are not interested if someone is somewhat good game designer and also storyteller and also game developer. They would like to hire someone who has dedicated past five years perfecting just one or two single, two minor domains. So it's also about delegating a large amount of tasks to a huge subset of teams. And sadly, there is not much space for creative expression for AAA game developers. It used to be a stable, stable employment in the past, but regarding the news from Blizzard and other companies, it's no longer the case. But still, it's a good way to boost your CV, to work for some big companies. And what is quite interesting that many well-known developers eventually decided to go indie. Uh, Jay Raymond, I already mentioned, Cliff Bleszynski, he worked for Epic Games, Chess Checker, Gear of Wars. 
uh, Brian Reynolds, City Minor Civilization, um, David Chaff, Jeff, he worked, he was the director of God of War, he left Sony, and also they, they all started their own companies. So many developers left. Uh, in terms of games released on Steam, there was something that happened in 2013, and it was, co it was called Floodgate Opening. So until 2013, Steam had the reputation as a key to a well-polished well game. But since 2013, they allowed, they allowed almost every, every game developer to publish their games. And of course, it, from, from then, it started to grow exponentially. So we used to have slightly below 1,000 games. Now we have, we have over 10,000. I'm not sure what happened here in 2019. Perhaps it was a glitch. And I don't have the data for this year, but I, I would assume the, the trend will go on. In terms of revenues, uh, the fact is that it grows bigger and faster than in the entire US economy. We are at $160 billion. I would say that also the check market is growing. It's around five or six billion check rounds. We, are, we have over 100 studios there. And uh, it's all growing. Even though the numbers are decreasing for PC and consoles, it doesn't mean that they are leaving. It only means that they are not growing as fast as smartphones and tablets. But if you take a look at the last two years, it looks like it will turn the tide. The, perhaps the situation will change. There was also a, there was a conference, and this lady gathered some data, and she found out that players, gamers, actually spend three billion hours a week playing video games. And the question, actually this was 10 years ago, so now it will be even three times more. And the question was if it's really worth it. And regarding to what Mehmet said about the fun and entertainment and also teaching education, of course it's worth it to some extent. So there's a nice contrast between the world of games and the world of game developers because it's another pair of shoes. Gamers are happy, of course, because they have so many games at their disposal that they can't, they can't even finish them within their lifetime, like all well-published well, well published games or well-reviewed games. It's the game developers who are struggling. So now we are arriving to something called game industry crisis. Um, in 1990s, you used to have a lot more, lot more ideas, a lot of ideas, because the market was very small. We used to have many ideas, but limited hardware. And now it's the other way around. We have really powerful hardware. We don't even need it. Most indie games don't need it. We don't need the latest hardware parts to run indie games well. That's the fact. But we lack the ideas. And even though it's very easy to develop a game, easier than ever, it's also harder than ever to develop a successful game. That's the major point. And there are many issues to it. First one is lack of differentiation. Uh, no, it's a low, bar low barrier of entry. And low barrier of entry means that everyone can make a game. Even a boy of 10, boy of 12 years, 12 years old, he can just take up some online courses and start making template games. Uh, next one, low, mean, low median ownership. I read the glasses, so I can't read it. <laughs> low median ownership. Um, it's the average number of players per game. Even though we have 10 times more games than we used to have 10 years ago, we have just three times or four times more players. So it's, it's kind of distributed, and the fact is that the games don't have even the time to become part of the culture, to go mainstream. And the problem is, if you just take five random people who are into games and ask them about their favorite games they have played in the past five years, it would be like, they will say something, but I wouldn't say there will be many intersections or many matches. Because there are so many games around that when you start playing something, you will very often ask the question of, I have seen, I have seen this somewhere, I have already seen it, or the concept is very similar to some other games. And the question is if we really need another or one more pixel art dungeon defender or Another, another one, uh, 3D FPS that takes place in some fun, fantasy land or something. Lack of differentiation, it's the same. Lack of different, differentiation, it, we have a lot, lots, of, lots and lots of games around and uh, it's quite difficult to deal with this. So the market is extremely oversaturated to the degree that we are still grappling with. 
All right. Now let's talk about game developers. What game developers are? First, what my friends think I do. Um, there's a difference between playing a game out of fun and playing a game due to obligation. If you, play if you are playtesting your game, you're just playing it for the sake of testing it or prototyping, it's, it's, con it's considered work and it doesn't need to be fun at all. When I played some games just because I wanted to shoot some videos, I wanted to show you in the past lectures, I was kind of even stressed out sometimes because uh, I couldn't find the right scene I wanted to shoot. Uh, yeah, this is just the parents often, very often, over mistreat their children if they decide to pursue this kind of career. And this is just to fill the gap. That society has a great picture about developers in general, archetyping. Uh, that's an issue, actually. This one, uh, even for de developers that were able to publish successful games, it's a negative experience when they get a hate storm from their community, from the players. They are complaining about some bugs. They all, there are always some bugs, but. Uh, the developers may get really, really, they can even burn themselves out if they can't fix the bugs as fast as the community expects them, expects them to do so. Because they think that everything can be fixed just by pressing a few buttons. This is what junior developers think they are doing once they put their hands for the first time on Unity or Unreal Engine. And this is what it really is. Uh, as Patrick Stafford said, his quote is in the last lecture, last minute talk. But, um, it's, it's an effort. It's effort above and beyond. And of course, sometimes sleep is the first to go and health may fall in the long term. So it's really drastically, drastically uh, difficult just to prototype your game and balance your game, especially when, when you really would like to publish it. From time to time, I watch some. I'm watching some posts, Facebook pages and so on, uh, indie game developers, indie game developers, IGD and some other Facebook pages. And uh, there are some interesting posts there, actually. The first one, for instance. I'm gonna read it for you. So he said, hey, I want to make a big MMO. It will feature dragons fighting with people just like Game of Thrones, and you will be able to hunt them for, from the ground with other players. I will have no mic microtransactions, so no drama like with Battlefront. Where can I find a good Unity course to start doing this? And at first I thought the guy was just trolling it. But once I took a deep dive into, into other posts, I figured out that these guys are that serious about it. Serious and sometimes lame and, lame and lazy, thinking that they can just uh, learn everything on, like, along the way and not even bothering with, with codes, with coding, and stuff like this. Another post. So I have a friend who doesn't want to pay for game make for for game maker for him make and doesn't want to learn Godot or Unity. Any suggestions for open source alternatives for game maker? And this interesting reply. I would start with changing the doesn't want to learn attitude before going into any engine out there. Because skills, of course, need to be learned. And this post says it says something about uh, some easy to develop game genres. And the second post suggests that you should avoid hyper casual games because you need to work with arrays. And the fact is that actually most developers don't have the background as you do. So you can consider yourself lucky because you have the background, data structures, algorithms, and stuff like this. And even Derek, Derek Yu, who worked on he worked on Spelunky. He claimed that whilst working on Spelunky, it was in 2007 or 6, he, he was a game maker, he didn't know back then how to work with arrays. So he spent some time learning data structures whilst working on, the, on his second game. Or not second game, but the other game. So, how to make a game? There are three stages to it. At first, of course, it's a good thing, actually, if you start working on some really simple micro games. Because you will get to understand how things are working from the technical point of view. Or even from the design point of view. But of course, to deliver something new, something fresh, or to change the existing formula, that's another story entirely. So that's the first stage. The second stage is about 
the beginning of prototyping. So do your research. You do your research, you start prototyping, you come up with the right, up with the right concept, up with some concept, and then you start prototyping your game. It may take even five years before you find out that you need to flush it out and start over. And the third stage, when you really start working on it, uh, when you start work, when you de decide to dedicate 100% of your time pursuing just one single thing, your productivity will grow exponentially. And some people actually do so by leaving their jobs, leaving their 9-to-5 existence, and deciding to just take a long vacation for one year or even more, and uh, spend their time working on their, on their games. And there is more, of course. Make a unique game that stands out, and if you run out of budget, get a job and go, go back to step one. Um, there are also people who sell their houses. There are, there, what was the name of the, of the guy? It was the... There are, there are some interesting articles and stories about, about game developers who just decided to sell their houses because they needed budget to just really, really desperately publish their games and finish their games and can take even three to five years. But the guys that really work really hard all year, all, the whole year long, uh, they have this slight advantage over the, over, over, the, over, the, over the other ones that just decided to uh, do it in their spare time. Of course, because they can outperform from them. And the thing is that you need to predict. You need to predict what the market will be like three years or four, five years from now. Because if it, takes, if it takes five years to create a game, you need to predict what the market will be like in five years. How not to make a game. That's also quite interesting. Um, there is a psychological effect. If you start working on something and tell your friends what you are working on, it will trigger something in your, in your mind and uh, you will consider it half done. So it's important until you have your very first MVP, shall we say, not to tell anybody what you are working on. And there is more, actually. It's, uh, it's also motivation. Because it's very natural that you will get bored, and you will get bored by your game. Working on something three years or just a couple of months, you will come up with new ideas for some other games, and it's very difficult to resist the temptation to start working on something else. And if you do so, you will end up like this guy who has got like, many construction sites and doesn't finish anything. And uh, just not to allow yourself to be led astray and really focus on just one single goal. I assume all of you know this one, right? Iceberg illusion. But actually, not many people fully comprehend this one. Uh, there is a term called survival spotlighting. It means that it's what happens when you focus on survivals of some process because they are showcased. And then you will overlook something else and you may come to a wrong conclusion. There is a nice story about, it's from World, World War II. Um, American bombers that were returning to the base, some researchers started studying uh, penetration like, to bullet holes. And uh, they found out that the most bullet holes were along the, along the wings, along the wings of the bombers. So they suggested to reinforce, to put an armor, more armor on the wings. And another guy, a statistician, came in and he suggested, he said that it was completely wrong. They should reinforce cockpit and the tail. And why? Because the parts, the, the bombers that were shot to the cockpit or to the tail, they never made it back to the base. They were just completely shot down. So the research was biased. There was something missing. So it's very important to also study failure and to take a look at some people, some articles that extol this kind of thing. And also it's about being at the right time, at the right place, at the right concept. Uh, there's an interesting game. It's called Eternal Daughter. And Eternal Daughter was developed by the same guy who made Spelunky. It was created in 2002 in something, I'm not sure about the name, but it was by Mike, Mike, 
Micromedia, but it was in Flash. And they, uh, it was a, it's a pixel art platformer with a really magnificent story and soundtrack. And uh, it was free, as a freeware game. Some people, some people have played it. However, had it been released just three years later, just after Cave Story, it would have been a bigger, much bigger success. It, it could even earn some money. The game actually didn't earn some, any money because it was released as a freeware game. And uh, Derek, you actually stated this, that he would assume if he had released this a little bit later, it would have, it would have gone perhaps even better. Because nobody wanted to play pixel art games in 2002. Even big studios canceled their prototypes in the late 90s because everyone wanted to focus on 3D cutting edge graphics and pixel art, the first pixel art wave came in 2005 or 6. Uh, there are some, it's a dead, I would say dead list, but let's say some interesting articles, stories that extol sacrifice and failure. Uh, it's also quite important to study them because perhaps you will get a fresh perspective out of what is it about and what things you should avoid. For instance, the one in the middle, up there, it's about... There was a game released on, Ste on, on Steam by a developer named Aaron, and even though it was a very promising game, he got completely burnt out because he got some hate storm from the players asking for more features and fixing some bugs. Therefore, he completely disappeared from the industry. industry and disappeared and... Uh, no one has ever heard of it anymore. And our tragic end of Telltale Games. Uh, they have fired 200 people and uh, cancelled the studio. They were on working that, if I'm not mistaken, and the game was finished by some Kickstarter crowdfunding. Right, so the question is, why do we even do it? Why do developers even dare to venture into this industry if the risk is so high? And Industry where just there are so solid, there are, there are just a few superstars, a few people that are capable of, of gaining success. And the answer is simple. It's called, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's raison d'etre. It's from French. Uh, it means the purpose or the meaning. And uh, it's the same reason why writers write books, why musicians write songs. There is something magnificent and beautiful about creative work, and uh, it's the footprints. The, just the ability to leave some creative footprints and to be able to express your ideas to the world, to leave something behind. And uh, this is actually what Jonathan Lone said. Uh, if, you, if you watched the video I published on YouTube a week ago, uh, he said that once you start working on something intricate, there is hope that, you will, that people will know, will get to know the things that you did, and you will be able to establish some line of communication with your audience. So this is it. Um, you have been exposed to, let's say, some model situation just to, uh, to create a very simple micro game with a strong focus on the technical aspects, on the programming aspects, of course. And we have covered many parts, almost everything. We have never gone too far or too deep. We have just slightly touched all the topics. And the purpose of this course actually was to give you a little preview, a small preview of what the game industry is, and perhaps just to establish an idea in your mind um, if you would like to pursue it, or if you if you would like to if you would like to go on and expand your knowledge further, and you can do so by all means, but you can do so by yourself. If you would like to learn Unity or Unreal, you can just take up some of my courses. You can join some communities. You can go to Discord. You can you can go to conferences. So this is up to you. The rest is up to you. And yeah, I mean. Uh, that's it. There is one more video I want to show you. Uh, it's an overview of an overview of, uh, let's say, indie games and some concepts that have been released or are to be released in the future.
access to computer room terminated. Right, there is one more slide, and as always, it's a goodbye quote, and this is from the very game I have been referencing almost throughout, throughout the, the whole course. Even though I'm not sure if I, even if I ever mentioned the game explicitly, but there are many references in many lectures. This is the second biggest sandwich I have ever seen. The guy with the yellow helmet. The very first side scroll for PC. Commander Keen. Commander Keen it is. All right, so uh, there will be some follow-ups in the lab. So if you're interested, you can join us upstairs. And there are some more examples we have to show you. Yeah, we have more examples. More examples. So you can join us. And I will also talk more about this game. Sure. And yeah, that's it. Uh, so if you would like to join us, by all means, you can do so. If not, or if you can't, we can just at least Wish you best of luck on your next journey and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. So that's all for the lecture and thank you for listening and thank, thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure.